second speaker of today, Professor Wolfgang Arendt from Ulm University, who will talk about semi-groups generated by first and second order operators on hard spaces. Please. Well, thank you very much. Well, thank you for the invitation. And um, uh, so this is a talk on semi-groups and um, well, semi-groups generated by first and second order differential operators, this is quite a standard subject. If we look at it from a PDE point of view, so we have just uh, maybe a domain in, in RD and so on. But what is quite new is to, to look at semi-groups um, uh, well generated by holomorphic uh, operators and I'll be, I'll be, be more precise now. So during the entire talk, I choose as Hilbert space, the space H2, H2 of D, which consists of all holomorphic functions on D, well, which have uh, power development with coefficients in little L2, so the Hardy space. And, um, <clears throat> uh, I mean, many of the things they say are true in HP and in other spaces, but I want to concentrate on, on this, uh, in this situation. I recall from the talk of Eddie Bernard, uh, the notion of a semi-flow. Well, actually, maybe I call it a global semi-flow. Uh, this is a family of holomorphic maps phi of t going from d into d, which leave invariant the disk, the unit disk. Phi zero is just the identity and we have the semigroup property. So phi t composed by phi s is equal to, is equal to um, phi of T plus S, so I'm in this, in this line. And then the second, the second or the last uh, property is just a continuity property, which, well, which may be, uh, there are weaker formulations, but they're equivalent to this one. So it's a continuous function on R plus cross D. And then one can associate a generator uh, to such a flow. So there exists a unique function uh, G, G is a holomorphic function on D, such that, well, the phi of T is just the, the flow generated by this differential equation. So phi T of uh, phi T Z differentiated with respect to T is G phi T of Z. And um, this, this G we call the generator of, um, of, of the flow, of the semi-flow. Uh, this, by, way, by the way, this consequence is an old result of uh, Bergson and Porter from 78. Now the question occurs, uh, which holomorphic functions occur in such a way? So we call this G the infinitesimal generator or the generator of the flow. So the question is for which functions G, there exists a semi-flow such that G is the generator of the flow. And Bergson and Porter, they, they answered this question in 79. And this is the first part of, of the following theorem. So the first equivalence. So G is the generator of a semi-flow if and only if there exists some, some B in the closure of D, a holomorphic function, well, such that the real part is on, or the image is on the right, or on the uh, right half plane. And G of Z is equal to B minus Z, one minus BZ uh, F of Z. So this is a complete characterization. Now you see this, this first part, this first equivalence is just in terms of the function G. It's a characterization in, the, in terms of the function T. Now, 
we are interested in semigroups here in this uh, on operator one parameter semigroups. So let us look at the operator which is defined by G, is a differential operator defined by G. So we define here an operator A on, on the Hilbert space L2, H2 of D by A of F is equal to G F prime. This is an unbounded operator and its domain is just the maximal, the natural maximal domain. So it consists of all F and H2, such that gf prime is in h2, the maximal domain. Okay, so we are talking about this operator given as a holomorphic function g on d, and we just define this maximal differential operator of order one on h2 of d. And then, well, I mean, the g is a generator of a semiflow if and only if this A generates a C0 semigroup. And then the semigroup has a natural form. I mean, the semigroup is just a composition, composition by this, uh, by this semi-flow. Okay, now, I mean, this, this equivalence here, well, it is, it is due to Isabel Charanda and Jonathan Partick then, in the case where the semigroup is quasi contractive, so this is this definition, there's no M here. So if there's an M in this place, then it's just an arbitrary semigroup. So it's quasi contractive. And then uh, this, is, um, this is proved by uh, Shalando and Patek then, but this general case remained open for some time. And um, <clears throat> so it was, um, it was settled. Uh, well, in by by two different teams, so uh, by by Eva Galado and Dimitri Yakubovich, and also by Isabel Saranda and myself. And actually, well, these these papers are uh, uh, are independent, but uh, each of us, each of the two teams, uh, got notice of the other work. And we, uh, well, in the papers, we give a lot of compliments, each one to the other, uh, to the other paper. And in fact, I mean, uh, the papers are quite different. The proofs are different. So whereas uh, the, the team by, by Eva and Dimitri, they use a very clever argument using uh, the Hadama formula for the uh, radius of convergence. We have more ODE, ODE arguments. So such a G always generates a local flow, and we prove that this is a global flow which leaves invariant the D. And also, the results are quite different. So uh, the fact is that uh, it depends on the Banner space of holomorphic functions. Now I just deviate from my general strategy. This is not only true on H2, it's true on, on general Banner spaces of holomorphic functions. And um, actually, well, Eva and Dimitri have one condition and we have two different conditions. So uh, this, if you are interested in this, then uh, well, the space, H, the space H2, is covered by all three theorems. So we have three, two th th theorems and Eva and Dimitri have one case. So uh, it is, you can read one of these papers, it doesn't matter, you can, um, <clears throat> it is a, 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 to, to understand the situation of our, um, of the theorem. Anyway, what is a nice thing, uh, the, these papers appeared in the same volume of Israel Journal. So if you buy one, you get the other one for free. And uh, um, so if you want to be very uh, efficient, then, and if you want to have, for instance, the disk algebra and the Hardy space in one blow, you better read the paper by Eva Dimitri. 
But if you just want uh, H2, you can do any of these three theorems. But if you are interested in some exotic space, then you better have the entire volume and you look at the three theorems with the three conditions. But maybe some of you did not buy yet this, this volume of Israel Journal. And uh, that's maybe a good idea because technology developed very fast. And actually, Eddie Bernard, uh, a few months after we had done this result, he, uh, he characterized or he uh, generalized the results uh, to, well, to the complete differential operator of first order. So uh, this means to an operator of this form where there is some perturbation. So this is, uh, well, an important, uh, in, important perturbation and uh, settles actually all operators of first order. And well, I refer to Eddie's beautiful talk yesterday. The result is much older, but uh, while well, due to Corona, he could not present it before. Uh, many of the conferences uh, have, have been delayed or, or even canceled. But so this settles everything I want to say about differential operators of order one. And of course, I mean, in this case of uh, the perturbation, we get weighted composition operator. So we get a flow and we, we get the weights. So my next, well, my next subject is operators of order two, but you see, I want to, to present a little interplay. Now we are talking about semi-groups for quite a while and we did not even talk about the Luma film theorem. This is the, well, somehow the, the minimal theorem, which with minimal hypothesis, a very beautiful theorem, characterizing contraction semigroups and Hilbert space. So let A be a, an operator on a Hilbert space. And then the following two things are equivalent. A generates a contraction semigroup on this Hilbert space. And then two conditions. The first one is dissipativity. So just real AXX scalar product in H is smaller equal or zero than all for all X in the domain. This is the dissipativity. And the second condition is the surjectivity, the range condition. So identity minus A from the domain to A into H, this is just a linear operator, is surjective. So this is a Lumophilic set. It's a characterization. Now, uh, <clears throat> you might also consider a unitary group. And then, then, of course, I mean, an operator B generates a unitary group. This is the same as saying that IB is self adjoint. And again, maybe I should have written this, this the third condition first. I mean, to say that B generates a unitary group means that plus B and minus B generate a contraction semi group. So, this is just the same. So the, the Lumo Phillips theorem also characterizes well self adjoint operators or generators of unitary C0. This is just uh, a consequence of uh, the Lumo Phillips theorem. So somehow it's Stone theorem, which is a consequence of Lumo Phillips. Now, uh, so there's a nice corollary which I want to present here. And this corollary uses both implications of the Luma Phillips theorem. So let UT, T and R be a unitary semigroup on H. H is just some, semi, some Hilbert space, and the generator is B. Well, then B square is self adjoint and generates a contractive C0 semigroup. So here, the, for, for B square, we have to, to explain what the domain is. The domain is all X in the domain of B, such that BX is in the domain of B again. And then of course we can, we can build up B, BX, so B square. Now the proof is just a consequence. So since U is unitary, I mean, this gives B being 
skewer joint, the scalar product of BXY is minus XBY. And then we get B square X, X is equal to minus BXX. And this is, this is of course smaller or equal than zero. So we have this activity automatically and we get also symmetry of B just by the same argument. And now the range condition is very easy. You see, you write identity minus B squared is identity minus B times identity plus B. These two operators are surjective. So this is a surjective operator of the B squared. So this is a, this is a very nice corollary of, of the lumor Phillips theorem. So let us look at it again. If we have a generator of a unitary group, then B square is self adjoint and generates a contractive C0 symmetry. So now I come to these second order differential operators. Of course, I mean, the general operator is of this form. The general second order operator would be of this form. So we have maybe three, four holomorphic functions, G1, G2, G3, Gf, and then we can form G1, 1, F prime, prime. This is, well, this is the second order term. And then we have first order perturbations, G2, F prime plus G3, F prime. So once the prime outside, once inside, and then a zero order term. So we are interested in such operators and we want to investigate under which conditions such operator generates a semi-group on H2. It's very strange. I believe this such subject had, has been attacked, attacked very lately. And I think the first paper on this is by Isabel Charmba and Jonathan Partington in 2017. And now, well, we have another paper on this. Well, it's mainly a paper on perturbation theory, but uh, this will maybe become more clear at the end of my talk. Okay. Now I want to start by, by this term and take G2, G3, G4 equal to zero first. So we take a pure order of pure second order, a differential operator, pure second order. And there's a, there's a nice first case. So if, if you define UTF of z equal to f e to the itz, I mean, then this is a unitary operator on H2 of d. This is very easy to see. So ut, okay, I should, should say ut uh, t in r. So this is here, okay. This is t in r. This is a unitary group on H2. It's a unitary C0 group on H2. And, uh, <clears throat> and it's easy to calculate its generator. You see the generator were formally C derivative in zero at zero um, of F. So you get, you get I z f prime of z, and, and this is true. I mean, the generator, well, I call it this script d, or I don't know, this, still, this, this differential d, and df of z is I z f prime of z. And the domain, the domain of, of it is really the maximal domain. So it consists of all functions such that Z f prime of Z is equal is again in H2. But this is the same as saying that F prime is in H2. Well, you see this by looking at the power series of F, and then you see that this is actually two. Now, for well, for this reason, since this is the the, the generator of a unitary group, then you see this is an skewer adjoint operator, and this is very convenient. So I prefer to write my differential operator in this way. So I, 
I, uh, I replace the prime by the D. And this is of course equivalent. You can, uh, you, you can transform one form and the other and back. But for, for this reason, since this, this makes it uh, skew a joint, it's, it's more convenient to, to use this operator. And there will be another reason, a reason which I will tell you at the very end of, the, of, the, of this talk. Okay, so we have this operator and now we take the corollary of, um, we take the corollary of the, of the Hille-Phillips theorem and then this corollary tells us d square generates a C0 semi-group on H2. So this is this corollary of, um, of the of Luma Phillips here. So this is already a nice case. This is somehow the Laplace. This is a Laplace, the holomorphic Laplace. And um, you see, uh, we settled already now the case where this function G is just a function one. Okay, so we settled this case by a very easy argument by just uh, Luma Phillips. But of course, you can go beyond this, and this is already contained in the paper by Schwalanda and Partington. If G1 is a holomorphic function such that the real part is larger than a positive constant nu, I mean, then we define the operator A1 on H2 by A1 of F is equal to, well, first DF that we multiply by G1, and then we take this differential and the domain maximal, F is in the domain of D and DF times G1 is in the domain of D again. And then A1 generates a holomorphic C0 semi-group and even each S of T is compact. Okay, now um, we remember if G1 is one, then our operator is self-adjoint. This was a corollary. The operator was self-adjoint if G1 is, well, if G1 is constant, if G1 is one, or of course, if it is a constant, which is positive, then it's a self-adjoint operator. But this is the only case. This is this next theorem. I mean, whenever this operator A1 is self-adjoint, then G1 is a positive constant. So this, the one direction was just the corollary from Luma Phillips, but the other direction is, is clever. It's a nice work argument from complex analysis. Well, of course, I learned from Isabel Chananda, this very nice complex argument. Okay, so all these operators generate holomorphic semigroups, but they are not self-adjoint unless G1 is just a constant function. Okay, now, um, well, <laughs> it's interesting. In this case, we can really determine the asymptotic behavior of the semi. Uh, we, we define now um, a projection well, as before, there is in the previous talk that a projection will occur, and the projection is a projection of rank one. So to f, we associate f of zero one d, and then s t minus p of zero. So this is the operator norm as operator on h two of d is smaller or equal than e to the minus nu t. So s of t converges to P zero, there is a there is a zero missing. P zero, okay. So ST converges to P zero exponentially fast, and it is interesting. This exponent here, which expresses the speed, is exactly oh, it is exactly this this new, and actually we proved 
I mean, the optimal new here is the same as the optimal new here. This is very, very uh, surprising. So this, this is just, the new is really optimal. I mean, this is, uh, this is not obvious. Again, I mean, the, the, the tool, but the, the techniques of Isabel, which, which are used to, to prove this. Now, the proof is also interesting because, um, because it's, it, it uses a criterion to prove invariance of, of spaces. If you have a semi-group, sometimes the closed subspace is invariant. So here you see A, applied to the constant one function is zero. I mean, the operator is, here yeah, the operator is this zero. If F is a constant constant, then DF is zero. So this shows that ST of a constant function is the same, is invariant. And now H2 is the direct product of, well, H2 zero and the constant functions and H2 zero are the functions which vanish at zero. And what we prove by using some criteria from semi-group semi theory, we prove that this space is invariant and on this space, well, the semi, well, P0 is zero, so the semi-group decreases exponentially. Okay, so we could settle the exponential behavior in this case of a pure second order operator. Now, uh, I, I, present you the most, uh, the, the most general result, the uh, most general result, generation result we have. And um, in order to present this, and, and this is actually based on, on some perturbation theory we develop on the paper, and that this is maybe the, the first, uh, the longest part, and we apply it to this situation. So we develop a, a perturbation theory. A perturbation theory, well, if you want to, for Luma Phillips or more, more precisely to form, form techniques, uh, uh, some perturbation. Okay, now I want to present the most general result we have. And for that, I define what it means Zg is an H infinity. So this is just a short, uh, shorthand writing for the following. G is a function which is holomorphic on the pointed disk, on the disk without zero. And Z, G of Z is, is bounded. Okay, so Z, G of Z is, is bounded. So this function may have a, has a pole of order one or may have a pole of order one in zero. And, um, <clears throat> and then, well, then the following is true. Well, we have four functions defined on, well, the, the disk without zero. G1 and G3, they, are, they satisfy exactly what is written in the definition. So Z, G1 and Z, G3 are in H infinity. So G1 and G3 may have singularities at zero. G1, well, is bounded below, or the real part is bounded below. Now, you see, if you have a function in H infinity, as it has radial limits. But then also a function of this form here has also radial limits, because you see this, the, 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 the radial limit of this function is, of course, the same as radial limit of G. So the real part of the radial limit of G1 should be larger or equal than eta. Eta is a fixed constant, positive constant, and this almost everywhere. And the two functions g2 and g4, they are just in H infinity. And then we define the operator A by, okay, so we take derivative of f, g1, g to f, and then the derivative. We take g3 of the derivative of f and g4, F. This is an order of order zero of this term. And the domain is maximal if we write it in this way. So this here has to be in the domain of D. So F has to be in the domain of D, 
And then we apply G1 to DF and G2 to F, add up, and this has to be in the domain of T. This is the domain of our operator. And then this operator here is a generator of a holomorphic C0. So this is what we can prove. And the way we do it, well, we start by this operator and then we, we consider perturbations. Well, there's, there's some, some work to do. Now, you might wonder why suddenly I come to more general assumptions here. Well, you see, it is not so surprising because we have this more general derivative. And in the more general derivative, there's a Z. Okay, this is, this is uh, a point. But it has a real reason why we do this and why, uh, why this comes up. So the reason is the following. Now, this subject, I mean, differential operators of, of second order, I said, this is a new subject. I didn't, never saw a paper before, before the paper of Partington and Chalanda. And, uh, but of course, on, on L2, on the space L2, this is a standard subject. So we have heat semigroups on L2 of the interval. And here is how they are defined. Well, I start, I mean, the subject is then the invariance of the holomorphic functions. So you will see this in a minute, but I want to explain first semigroups on this space here, on the space L2 of zero of two pi. So there's no holomorphic whatsoever. H2 of 0, 2 pi, this is those functions in L2 of 0 pi with vanishing negative Fourier coefficients. So F hat of n is just a Fourier coefficient. And this space, of course, is isomorphic to L2 of, the, of H2 of the disk. So it's a, it's a different description of the operator H2 of D. But on this space here, well, on this space, we also have a Sobolev space. And the Sobolev space, well, usually it's defined by those functions f in L2, such the derivative is in L2. But there is, an, there is an equivalent description. We can say, because we are in one dimension, it consists of continuous functions, functions continuous up to the boundary. So, on the closed interval, they are continuous. And there exists a function f dot in L2, such that f of t is equal to f of zero plus integral zero t, uh, to t f dot of sts. So this is like in C1. I mean, this is the fundamental theorem of calculus, but the derivative is just in L2. And then you can prove actually that the the derivative almost everywhere of this function is this f dot. I use f dot so for this generalized derivative. It's a derivative almost everywhere, but I mean the function is absolutely continuous. So the f of t can again be written by the improper integral. And this is the same as a Sobolev space. It's not the original definition of the Sobolev space, but it's the same as a Sobolev space. But this description of the Sobolev space has the advantage. It consists right away of continuous functions. So it makes sense to ask the functions to be periodic. And this I call the periodic Sobolev space. So it's a subspace of L2. It's a subspace of L2 of this space L2 of zero two pi. Okay, so here in this part, the, the, the H2 of the interval does not occur yet. It's just a, a definition. Now, here, here's, a, here's a theorem which is well known. Many people who work in semigroups will know the theorem or will be able just to prove it. Let H be a function which is an L infinity of the, of the torus. Yeah, I write it in this way. I mean, on purpose. So the tor is it's a torus. 
And I assume that the real part of H of P to the IT is larger equal to that U for some U which is positive. Okay. Then we define an operator A tilde on L2 of zero to pi. L tilde of U is, well, H U dot, and then a dot again. And the domain consists of all periodic Sobolev functions such that h u dot is again a Sobolev function, periodic Sobolev function, and u tilde u is h u dot dot. This is the definition of a tilde. And then a tilde generates a C0 semigroup s tilde t on L2 of 0 pi. Okay, now let us come back to the, the beginning of the talk. I mean, we have a subspace of L2, well, a closed subspace, so, so Hilbert space H2 of L2, which is isomorphic to H2 of D. And this is a space which is interesting us in this talk. So there's a natural question. When is this space invariant by the symbol? Okay, and now I will tell you when this when this is the case. So S tilde, S tilde is the semigroup generated by A tilde on this space L2. So this S tilde leaves H2 invariant if and only if H head of N is equal to zero for N larger or equal than minus two. And I was surprised when we found out this because I would have expected, I mean, that it is, well, that the H has to be holomorphic. I mean, that the H head of N is zero for N also for N equal to minus one, but this is not true. This is if and only if. Okay, but if this is true, I mean, then, well, then the H is not holomorphic, but you find G1 such that Z G1 is an H infinity and H of T is G1. Well, the, the um, radial limit of H1 e to the IT. Now, remember, remember uh, G1 F prime, this defines a generator, AF G1 prime with maximal domain defines a semigroup, a generator of a semigroup. And this is a semigroup on H2 of D, which is isomorphic to the space H2 zero to pi. And of course, I mean, it is true. I mean, if this is, I mean, if this is invariant, so if this condition is true, I mean, then the restriction of S tilde is, well, isomorphic to ST. So the isomorphism is just we identify these two spaces and then these two operators become identical. Okay, and now I'm already quite at the end of my talk and now I give you the second reason why, 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 why it is better to consider this D than the, than, than the prime, because these two spaces are isomorphic. And if F corresponds to G by well, this natural isomorphism, I mean, then F is in the domain of, of D, if and only if G is in the, in the periodic subordinate space, and df is equal to g prime, g dot. So the g dot, this is a natural thing on the, on the L2 situation. And if, if we then look at the invariant space, then we come in a natural way to this, to this d. So it's better to consider this d than, than the prime in, in this context. Okay, and now, um, yeah, so this, this is actually the, the end of my talk. Uh, I should um, 
but somehow I should uh, well, I have to come back now to all this. So, so my talk, I mean, it, it, what I presented this is so this is joint work with um, joint work with Isabel Sonda and with Milud Molenzana. And this is just in the last issue of term of operator theory, it just appeared. But you see the, the first part is, is just abstract. There's no holomorphic function or whatsoever. It is um, a perturbation result um, on, um, well, on forms. So, um, uh, well, now, if somebody asks me, I can explain this perturbation result, uh, but uh, I would prefer, since the holomorphic part is finished, I thank you for the attention and I finish here. Thank you very much for a wonderful talk. So any questions, suggestions, comments? We have plenty of time. Damir? <clears throat> yeah, speaking of applications to PDEs, I was wondering uh, if you would decide to do it on a poly disk, what would be the obstacles? Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I mean, of course, <laughs> you see, this is, uh, this is what I came when I prepared this talk. I, uh, this is came to my mind, of course, you should look at operate of second order operators on the poly disk, and then they have this a similar form as, uh, as we do in PDE on, on the bounded domain or so on. Uh, this is, I think, an interesting subject. Yes, of course, <laughs> this is a good idea, <laughs> but we didn't do it. I mean, just we did this now and uh, so. I don't know whether something changes, whether this is more difficult or whether this is just straightforward. I don't know. Thank you. Yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, more questions? Uh, Marco? Marco? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, so uh, thank you for this talk. My first question is, uh, can we have the same kind of result for the Bergman space, for example? For the? the Bergman space. You take the same type of operator. Yeah, yeah. No, well, I don't know. Uh, I, this also, I mean, um, this is very much Hilbert space. So, uh, well, I don't know. We, <laughs> Uh, we just didn't try, I mean, so far. Uh, it is possible, I mean, uh, also, I mean, we, we did not do yet uh, even W, even, I mean, Hardy space, LP Hardy space. I mean, this is, uh, I'm convinced that, the, that, this, that these semi-groups, I mean, here in exactly this result, yeah, which, which is now on the slide, I mean, these semi-groups, which we obtain, they should interpolate on all, uh, on all uh, Hardy spaces. I'm convinced that this is true, but well, this needs proof. This needs a proof. Okay. Yeah, but thank you for the idea. Uh, that one space is quite natural. Yeah. Because in, in fact, it will be interesting because it is very close to a problem in control theory. In fact, if you can prove this kind of result for the Bergman space, maybe not of the disk, but of a square. Yes. Uh, in, in fact, you can prove some perturbation uh, uh, result in control theory. So it oh, will okay. be. Could you, I mean, uh, yeah. Could you give me a hint, maybe a, some, some reference or something? Yeah, I can send you some some brief. Ah, okay. Yeah, it, thank you. It, it's related to the reachable space. To the? Reachable space in control theory. Ah, okay, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. More questions, comments? Well, if not, let's thank Wolfgang again. <clears throat>